so today I want to talk about how we've been using nanopore sequencing to understand uh, AAV genome replication and uh, production. At Modalis, uh, we're focused on uh, developing a platform for gene, mo gene expression modulation. So we use this platform to upregulate compensatory genes or, down, or uh, knock down uh, toxic gene expression. Uh, so one of the things that we're concerned with is how do we get this platform to the right tissue and sometimes the right cell type in the, in the body. And so uh, to this end, we've been focused on taking all these components within our platform and packaging them into AEV particles uh, for delivery. And so what components do we need to package? We, and generally speaking, we package uh, promoters, and these promoters uh, might need to be specific for the tissue or the, the target tissue or the cell type. Uh, transgenes, which might need to undergo some sequence optimization for codon usage, uh, splice site removal, and so on. And then polyadenylation signals. And promoters and polyadenylation signals can have a lot of sequence complexity. And this sequence complexity isn't always compatible with um, AAV uh, genome replication. And so throughout this talk, and by the end of the talk, I want to show you how we've been thinking, how we've been using nanopore sequencing to sort of understand uh, the sequence complexity that might not be compatible at as early stage as possible. Okay, so this project got started when we made four AAV preps, which I've labeled A through D here. Uh, we got pretty good production from uh, three out of the four, uh, but group C gave really low production yields even after a few trials. Uh, we extracted the genomes from, this, uh, from the group C and we found that we had a major peak in, in, in a capillary electrophoresis gel. We had a major peak that corresponded to the full length genome, but we also had some smaller products uh, there too. When we looked at uh, genomes from the other uh, three preps, we ma mainly see a peak that corresponds uh, to the full length genome. So when we saw this, we wanted to get a better understanding of what these smaller products might be and how that, uh, why, why and how that they might be affecting the uh, low production or the low vi viral titer that we were seeing in these preps. Okay, so for those of you who haven't uh, maybe been thinking about AAV genomes before, AAV genomes are uh, very small genomes, or, or quite small genomes. Um, in the middle is some genetic cargo, and these are bordered by inverted terminal repeats, or ITRs. Um, these are, during AAV replication, the uh, plus and minus strands are produced, and, then, and these are packaged uh, separately. So each viral uh, particle contains a, a, plus, a single stranded uh, genome. And so once we saw these uh, from the capillary uh, gels, we assumed that we likely had a population of full-length um, AAV par uh, genomes, um, but then also some truncated variants. And we didn't really have a good understanding of what these truncated variants might be. Some of them might be uh, folded back on themselves and have two ITRs. Some of them might have one IT bar, ITR but missing the other and some truncation in the middle. And so we wanted to sequence this population to get a better understanding of what, was, uh, what, what we were seeing here. Um, so, uh, as with any sequencing application, we wanted something where we uh, didn't make too many assumptions about the population um, ahead of time. And then we also wanted to use a long read sequencing platform because we wanted to get as much information about these uh, truncations as possible, or these truncated genomes as possible. Okay, so we started looking at long read sequencing uh, protocols that have been published uh, for AAV genomes, and uh, many of them follow the same uh, sequencing preparation pipeline where you take your AAV sample, you digest with DNAs. Uh, this gets rid of the non encapsulated uh, DNA. So then you can extract your AAV genome. Uh, you can prep, there's an end prep step that pr uh, prepares that DNA uh, for ligation of sequencing adapters. And once you have the sequencing adapters there, now you can sequence using either PacBio or nanopore sequencing. And the really nice thing about this ligation-based approach is that you get sequencing from one end of the genome to the other. So it's really clear uh, what you're looking at. Um, however, we did have some concerns when we were looking at, okay, so I think, uh, we had a, a few concerns when we were looking at these uh, protocols, specifically with the end prep uh, step. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, these uh, genomes have these sort of funny ends where there's a lot of secondary structure in the ITRs. We weren't sure how compatible these would be with uh, ligating um, sequencing adapters. And then the end prep step also kind of fills in sort of gaps at the ends to make this more compatible for the ligase. And uh, it wasn't clear to us if this filling in might also sort of fill in some of our truncated genomes. And some of these artifacts might be a little uh, hard to discriminate once we, had our, um, once we had our sequencing results back. So we sort of set out to look, out for, to look for uh, replication-free uh, sequencing prep protocols that didn't have this end prep step. 
And fortunately, Nanopore again to the rescue. They had a, a sequencing uh, protocol using using a rapid barcoding uh, sequencing. And so this, instead of uh, ligating sequencing adapters on the end, this uses a transposase uh, co uh, complex to uh, cut double-stranded DNA and insert uh, uh, sequencing adapters uh, within the double-stranded DNA. Um, when we started reading this protocol, we thought that this would be good for our application here because we have plus and minus uh, AV genomes that can, uh, that, that can base pair. So this, and then also the ITR. So there seemed to be a lot of double-stranded um, uh, uh, substrates for these transposase complex uh, to, uh, to insert uh, sequencing adapters. One drawback, one significant drawback, is that we can't really expect to read from one end of the genome to the other. and That, that is a significant uh, d disadvantage here. But we thought with our uh, analysis that we might be able to uh, get around that. Okay, so we tested out some of the AAV genomes and sequenced uh, them. And uh, we were um, at first sort of uh, pleased to see that some of our read lengths extended the entire length of the genome. Um, of course, not all of them did. We had uh, shorter read lengths as well that were sort of distributed uh, throughout the length of the genome. But we were sort of optimistic that this would give us some information about these uh, truncated species. Um, but again, we are probably going to need to think about our sequencing analysis because we, we aren't seeing the from it. We can't depend on a sequencing read from end to end. And so instead of, uh, s instead of looking at the entire genome, we, we were more interested in the ends of the, the alignments. So wh where, do these, uh, wh where do these sequencing reads end? Uh, we thought that this might give us some more information on these uh, truncations. And so I'd like to go through the analysis that we did. And I, I'm going to first start with an excised piece of DNA that represents an AAV genome. So this is just a double-strand piece of DNA. On the top row, uh, we just do the complete coverage of the plus and minus strands. Underneath that, in the middle row, we're going to look at just the five prime ends of the alignments uh, for the plus genome on the, in green and the minus genomes <coughs> in red. And then on the bottom row, we're only going to look at the three prime ends of those alignments. And so what we saw from this double-stranded uh, AV genome uh, represented, representative is that we got pretty complete coverage throughout the entire genome. Um, when we looked at the five prime ends, uh, for the most part, they were sort of randomly distributed throughout the entire genome. This is, this is good. This sort of means that that transposase complex is likely uh, adding uh, sequencing adapters throughout the entire genome. And then in the third row, we see the uh, pile up or signal at the three prime end of that DNA molecule in the forward, uh, in the forward and the reverse uh, strand. And so this isn't that interesting, but it does sort of give us some information about this, uh, about this double-stranded DNA, and we can sort of map uh, the ends already. Uh, so next we took one of our well-behaving AAVs. So this was uh, a genome that was extracted that uh, was mostly uh, full length. And we got really nice coverage throughout the entire uh, length of the uh, genome. Uh, we saw a pretty random distribution uh, when we looked at the end, the five prime ends of the alignments. Uh, some preference maybe for the ITRs. Um, and then when we looked at the three prime ends, we saw these double peaks. And uh, these double peaks are, are actually, that make a lot of sense because the ITRs have two different conformations called flip and flop. And so we think that these double peaks represent those, uh, those peaks. Um, but what we didn't see is mu much signal from the three prime ends of the alignments uh, throughout the body of the AAV genome. Um, even when we increase the, uh, the signal by about tenfold. Okay, so then we took our uh, population that had uh, the, our mixed population, and we did the same analysis. Uh, this time we got uh, pretty good coverage, again, throughout the length of the uh, genome, but this time at the five prime end, we got a little peak. Um, and then at the three prime end, we get a little bump as well. Um, this time, when we look at the five prime end of the alignments, we see an, uh, more signal within that promoter region and then a couple spots along the way. And then in the three prime end, now we see in this promoter region, we see a pretty significant uh, signal uh, when we increase about tenfold. And so uh, when we started looking at this, uh, you know, we, we wanted to get a better understanding of why we were seeing this uh, within this uh, sequencing alignment. And one thing that jumped out to us was that the, some of these uh, signals showed a five prime end uh, on the reverse strand that was the exact same position as the three prime end of the uh, forward of the forward strand. Um, that sort of jumped out to us, but we wanted to get a little bit better understanding of why we might be seeing this. And to do that, we wanted to look at the alignment types. And uh, during session two, um, 
Tassos actually gave a, already gave a nice description of what chimeric reads are. I'll do it again here, but chimeric reads are where one portion of the uh, read uh, by, or, uh, aligns with a portion of the genome and then another portion aligns with another portion of the genome. But these, this isn't continuous. And so what the aligner does instead of throwing out these reads, it labels one as primary or tags one as primary and the other as uh, supplemental. When we looked at the distribution of alignment types uh, that we saw uh, in our well-behaving AV and then in our pool, uh, we saw that the primarily the uh, alignment types were of the primary were primary alignments. When we looked at the reads that were responsible for or the alignments that were responsible for this peak that we saw on the promoter, it was about 50/50, and this really indicates that it's mostly that these are mostly uh, chimeric reads. We pulled out these chimeric reads and took a little closer look at them, and what we found was that uh, they were actually chimeric. They were um, aligning to the same spot, but in the opposite direction. So we had the prim primary alignment uh, on the plus strand, and that ended, and where that ended, um, a supplemental um, alignment began. And th this started to explain why we were seeing this uh, signal in the, at the, same, in the same positions here. Uh, this was pretty um, interesting, and as Tassos mentioned, uh, these uh, types of reads can be indicative of um, some structural rearrangements. And so uh, we took uh, those reads, extracted those reads, and did some secondary structure analysis uh, using MFOLD. And what we found is that many of these reads were actually forming these very long and stable hairpins. Um, and so once we saw these hairpins, we started to kind of go back to our original uh, sequence and we could map what, what these hairpins represented. What we found is that we, we could map an ITR uh, that uh, led into a portion of the promoter. Uh, that, promo that promoter was then cut off and sort of hairpinned around into a self-complementary portion of the uh, promoter and then another hairpin. So what we think we're seeing is these uh, mini genomes that are, that are sort of encapsulated uh, double portions of the, of the promoter. When we saw this, we uh, developed a model for sort of future studies where we think that uh, we're seeing reduced yield because there's two pathways, there's two competing pathways. We think in one pathway is our canonical um, AAV replication where the, a the ITR is extended. Uh, this produces the plus and minus full length genomes. Uh, these are then packaged into functional AAV particles. On the other hand, we think uh, that uh, when you have problematic sequences uh, that you start to stall replication at these sequences and then this results in these truncated genomes. These can pick up an ITR on, an, on another, um, AV, or another AV genome and we think that these smaller ones are packaged into non-functional um, AV. And what you end up with is a population, a mixed population of functional and, and non-functional um, AV. Uh, when we saw this, we were kind of excited that there seemed to be a signature where we could identify these problematic sequences. And so we took all the possible combinations of sequence elements that we might want to put into an AAV vector. We made a plasmid library for that. We took this plasmid li library and just made an AAV pool and then did the same sequencing that I described earlier. And in this pooled format, we were again, oh, I'm sorry, I should back up. So we did this, we performed an alignment against an artificial genome that basically just contains all of those sequences. And what we found is that we were able to identify these sort of uh, signatures um, in this promoter in the pooled format. And so now, you know, when we start a project, uh, we just uh, think about all the promoters, all the sequences that we, we might want to include. Uh, we clone them and then do some sequencing and sort of ask and, and, uh, um, and do and uh, se sequence in a pooled uh, format. This is uh, super cost effective and uh, really easy to do for us so that we can test some of these uh, potentially problematic sequences um, at, a early, at a very early stage in the program. Okay, so I wanted to uh, tell you more about how we're moving this in vivo by barcoding uh, these vectors. I don't have time to do that uh, during this talk, um, but I would like to save uh, some of this for happy hour. So uh, if we can chat about um, how we're using barcoded constructs to measure transduction in uh, tissues and at the single cell level, um, I'd love to do that at happy hour later today. Okay, so in conclusion, um, we really think that we found a really nice cost-effective way using nanopore sequencing to uh, identify uh, problematic sequences um, at an early stage in the program uh, before we get uh, ma making too many AAVs. And with that, um, I'd like to thank all my um, uh, colleagues at Modalis, especially Dhruv, who did a lot of this work as an RA at Modalis, and Oxford Nanopore for a lot of help and guidance along the way, and for the invitation to speak here. Uh, thank you. <laughs>